Okay, it looks like it's 5.15, so I think, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Jan Kemp, Assistant Dean for Public Services at the University of Texas at San Antonio. My co-presenter is William Glenn. He's Head of Reference Services at UTSA. Our briefing today is called Transforming Online Reference with a Proactive Chat System. And today we'll be talking about how our library experienced dramatic increases in the number and complexity of chat questions after we switched to a proactive chat system in 2013. I'll start by giving an overview of the system and then it, and its characteristics, and then William will provide some details about uh, some of the system's features. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So, Zopum is a chat system that was created for use by online businesses. It's not one that was in the library world, and um, some of you, or maybe not, but in 2013 we did a presentation uh, about Zopum after we've, we, here at CNI, after we'd had it up for about four months. And so now it's been two and a half years, and um, the increases that we saw after those first four months have only continued and increased uh, in the last two and a half years. Um, you know, as soon as we implemented Zopum, we immediately started receiving large numbers of questions. And in fact, um, the increase from 2013 to 2015 was 489%. Um, I know, it's incredible. Uh, it was to us too, we had, we had no expectation for that. But we don't think that our library is unique. We think that this system would work for anyone. So hopefully what you see today will give you some ideas about that. So actually, Full Force, Full, Full Force Online Reference was predicted in 2005 by Charles Martel, who was then the Dean of Libraries at um, California State Sacramento. He said, well, he was talking about the slowdown in the use of physical services in libraries, including reference, and he said, reference transactions will probably remain soft until online reference services appear in full force. However, I think for many libraries, they, they're still soft. In our case, I think we have seen full force. Um, so maybe we'll tell you a little bit about that. Before I go any further, I just wanted to give you a, a couple of facts about University of Texas at San Antonio. We're one of the, the UT system libraries. We're the third largest. We have about 29,000 students. And our physical library is extremely busy. Our main library on, on a busy day in the fall um, has anyone from anywhere from uh, 9,000 to 10,000 visitors in it. And that's almost a third of our student body. So, you know, we, we feel that we, although we had a lot of students in the library, uh, even back in 2013, they weren't using our reference services, whether in person or chat. Um, and so, we had a goal. We wanted to reach more students with reference. The questions that we did get made us realize that there are a lot of students with questions out there, and there's no reason why these students who ask would be so different from the others. And so we started looking around for a chat system that might attract more users. And our user experience librarian, uh, when she went to the ACRL conference in 2013, um, saw a presentation by the library, uh, librarians at John Carroll University, and they had just implemented Zopum, and it had doubled the number of chat questions, and maybe even more exciting for them, they had increased the, the complexity of chat questions to about like 75% of the questions that they received were they considered to be complex. Um, so we decided to go ahead and give it a try, and um, there's a lot of times in life where you have to say the change didn't happen overnight. But in this case, the change did absolutely happen overnight. On July the 22nd, uh, 2013, we had eight chat questions, and that was very typical for us. The next day, uh, July 23rd, we had five times that many questions. And that was without any change in our staffing, our marketing, or our hours. So, you know, we just had to attribute that completely to the, the new system that we implemented. Um, and what we saw also very quickly was that the majority of these questions were complex questions. They were actually questions from students who were working on topics, who needed help uh, figuring out which database to use or, or didn't understand the, the topic they were working with. And so six weeks later, we began staffing chat with librarians only, which was uh, quite a shock to the system. Um, so what do we think, whoops, went one, one, two, five. Okay, so one of the, the characteristics of, our, uh, of the Zopum system, um, there is a chat box on every page of the library website now, including in Summon. 
So it, it's there um, ubiquitously throughout the library website. Um, perhaps the most distinctive feature, I think, is its context-sensitive triggers. So what will happen is um, the libraries who use it have the opportunity to um, notice which parts of the website, which pages give patrons the most difficulty by looking at web analytics. And so, for example, one uh, place where we have a trigger is the Find Databases page. We noticed that when students would go to that, good things did not happen afterwards. And so <laughs> we, um, now what we have is a, a trigger on that page. And if a student or a <coughs> faculty member, for that matter, sits on the Find Databases page for 30 seconds without taking any action, a new chat box pops up in the middle of the page. It's a little bit larger than, than the one, um, the, the regular one. And it, it's context sensitive. It says to them, can we help you find a database? So it knows that they're on the Find Databases page. And William will show you in a little bit more detail how that works. Um, another feature is that the chat session continues as the user moves throughout the website. It doesn't go away if they leave. And the chat box can be customized and branded, which is something that we did, which I'll show you an image of it in a few minutes. So what do, we, what do I think caused the chat increase? I think that the branded larger chat box, which was so different from what we were using before, really gets their attention. Um, the chat box wording has changed a lot. We used to say, ask a librarian, and that's kind of kind of dried. So we, we moved to something more friendly, chat with us. Um, I believe that the triggers are offering them help at the point of need, which before they would, there were several steps for them to, to get to the chat box. And I think that it makes sense that users would ask more difficult questions online and more questions online because that's where the library research is taking place now for the most part. So here is the library homepage on the right and in the right hand corner of the bottom you can see the chat box. So it's quite orange. Um, it says chat with us and the image there is a, an icon of our uh, Blue Crew um, team member. We brand our public services uh, staff as the Blue Crew and that's Blue Crew Sue. So trying to make it friendly and appeal. I don't particularly like Blue Crew Sue, but students apparently like Blue Crew Sue. That's, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, and then on the left hand side is what the chat box uh, looks like when they've, the student has asked a question. You is the student and it's saying, I need to locate an article in the Journal of Visual Communication in Medicine. Can you point me in the right direction? And then Rita is our librarian. And you see they're branding her as a member of the Blue Crew and saying, um, you know, and then she, she'll answer their question. This page shows the, what the triggered chat box looks like. On the right is the triggered chat box. It pops up a little bit above where the, the other chat box would have been in the lower right hand corner of the bottom. It's a little bit bigger, and as you can see, as I mentioned with the Find Databases page, the, um, the wording there is context sensitive. It says, hi there, let us know if we can help you find a database. And it's comparing it with, on the left-hand side, the, the regular chat box that's sitting there on every page. So as I mentioned, we ex we've experienced a huge increase in chat, and um, we started off in fiscal year 2013, about six weeks of that 2013 fiscal year was open. The rest was our lower, our lower level chat. So 4,600 questions in 2013 to over 20,000 in 2014, was it, which was a full year of Zopum. And then this past fiscal year, 27,039 questions. Um, that's both reference and directional, everything that came in through chat. Um, So it, it's continued to grow too with, you know, William has, has worked um, constantly to try to make our chat service more efficient and, um, and, and so in the week of September the 27th, 2015, uh, we had over a thousand questions for the first time in one week. Um, in fact, you know, we, we found out that many faculty, are, not many, but some faculty are, have started to uh, encourage their students to get on chat when they're working on a, a project. And I think what may have happened one morning when we had 34 questions in one hour um, <laughs> was maybe something like that. Uh, and that was an hour we weren't prepared for, so we had to <laughs> take some names and call people back <laughs> or email them back. So we've also found some, um, done some interesting comparisons about the complexity of the questions that we receive. So the, the um, bar on the left is the percentage of complex questions that we receive at the desk. 
in two sample weeks, uh, February 2015 and September 2015. The total number of uh, questions at the desk was about 420. The total number of uh, questions um, that were, were categorized in, in chat was 1,750, something like that. So just to give you an idea of the numbers. Um, and so 20% of the, the desk questions were complex reference questions and almost 75% of them. And in fact, that just matched what, what uh, the John Carroll University found out from Zopum too, when they implemented. And then, this is um, something that's pretty interesting. It looks like the questions are more complex when it's a triggered chat than when it's a, it's a question, when it's a question that comes from a patron-initiated chat. So if we prompt them to ask their question, 82% of those questions are reference questions, complex questions, not simple ones like, you know, where is the study room, or, or can you help me find a known item? Um, and 65.4% of those, the sample questions in those two sample weeks were um, complex for patron initiated. And in fact, the trigger chats are the majority of our chats now, or barely, right? It's like right at 60, right under 60%, something like that. Yeah. So. So if we weren't triggering chats, if we weren't inviting them to chat, our chat numbers would be cut in half, or less than half, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. See? So just for fun, I wanted to share with you, because everyone loves reference questions, so here are 10 questions that were asked in a one hour period on Sunday, October the 25th. Um, William happened to be the lucky person who was working chat at the time when all these chat questions came in. So. For the benefit of our, our audience here on the, that's in the recording, let me, let me just read a couple or a few. I'm trying to zero in on a topic for my literature review and find articles from specific journals on the topic. Currently, my topic is cultural variances in female leadership in nonprofit organizations. Question two, I'm looking for books or journal articles, government doc, about the roles of GSEs in operation of CRA. Would you mind helping me find an article on the United States Depression in the 1930s? I have an essay assignment about the benefits of higher education, and we need three academic sources from scholarly databases. And I need help finding a court case where the defendant is facing the death penalty and where the defendant is still alive. So these are uh, all pretty, could be pretty meaty questions, depending on where the chat goes from here. And that's just in, in one hour. So it, you know, it's, it's, um, they're not that, those are not that atypical. Or they're not atypical at all, they're typical. So faculty are asking us questions as well, which was something we didn't see before when we um, had our other chat. I think they know perfectly well they have a subject librarian, but they know also the subject librarian doesn't work nights and weekends. So here are a couple. A journal asked me to provide keywords for my manuscript. Should I select keywords from established lists to make sure others find my paper? And I'm looking for respondent level data sets for my students to analyze using SPSS. What might you recommend? So you can see why we like to have librarians to <laughs> answer those, those kinds of questions. And so, you know, to conclude um, my first part of this, I, would, I just wanted to say that um, we're pretty sure that these questions had been out there all the time. I think that because as soon as we implemented Zopum, the numbers jumped right up, and they stayed there for two and a half years. So it's not anything that we had to build slowly and work really hard for us, just boom. So you know what I, what I would just like to say is that um, I think that the proactive chat has lowered the bar of inquiry for our reference questions, and now the library can play a larger role in supporting student success. So William? Hello. Okay, so I just wanted to go through some of the back end of this and give you some additional information. Uh, maybe we'll answer some of your questions you might have in mind. Um, so my name is William Glenn. Uh, before I was at UTSA, I was at Stony Brook University in New York, where I managed the virtual reference systems there for seven to eight years using initially OCLC's question point for quite a few years and then later uh, SpringShare's LibChat. And I think one year we had a little over 2,000 questions. So we, we can do that now in about two or three weeks. And so for me, coming, I, I've been at UTSA now a year and a half almost, 
I, you know, I interviewed for the job. They told me all of this. I looked it up, did my research, but not until I got there and really experienced the difference between what I'd been doing for seven or eight years and this did I understand how powerful and transformational this really is. And after a year and a half, I, I mean, I'm still stunned um, at how many, not only how many questions we get, but again, the, the kind of questions we get, the, the complexity, and the feeling that we really are uh, helping students uh, in a way I hadn't felt maybe as much for a while. So I'll, I'm gonna go into the triggers a bit more and the statistics, how we use those, shortcuts, which are very helpful, and then a really exciting uh, aspect of all of this that we've sort of discovered is mining our chat transcripts. So just to kind of reiterate uh, what Jan showed earlier, this is our Find Databases page, and here is the chat that has been triggered. So as she said, the, we have the widget all throughout the website and within Summon. We currently only have triggers on uh, two of the pages. The Find Databases page, which we know from analytics is the most visited page after our home page, and also within Summon, in the results in Summon. We thought, as she said, those were really the points of need, people trying to figure out they, you know, a lot of our students are still working with the, the jargon of libraries, you know, they don't really know what they need if it's a database, a journal, an article, but they've been told databases, so they do tend to go here a lot. So that's, those are two of the, uh, with, then we also have a third trigger, which comes on after 50 seconds when one of the librarians has not responded. Uh, it's our chat rescuer, it's called, and that's very helpful when we're really, really busy. It's not on a page, it, it can be, um, it's really part of these triggers. And um, let's look at the back end. So this is actually, it's pretty simple. There are a lot of different parts there, but really you can set these up once you've done one, it's very, very easy to do the others. The, the three most important parts, and I don't know if you all can see it, but it's like you want the first red circle there, the, the URL of the page you want. And then the second one is the time length. How long do you want patrons to be on that page before it goes off? Um, actually, you can see that was 35 seconds. This is for the Find Databases page. We've been playing, experimenting a bit with the time length, trying to find, you don't want it going off too much, but you also want to catch them in need. Um, so you can change that very easily. And then down at the bottom, send message to visitor and you just type in the language that you want. And you can adjust these as necessary. The, the others are kind of conditions, logical sorts of things. If the visitor's doing this, you don't want them, uh, one of those is if they've already initiated chat, you don't want the trigger to go off, things like that. But um, really once, like I said, you do one, then you can set up the others very easily. And I don't know if there's anything else on that page. We did have them earlier on the e-journals page. Actually, that was removed even before I got there. I, I'm not, do you remember why? Um, <laughs> Probably just not as much traffic, perhaps. Uh, the definitely summon our discovery system gets a lot of that in the homepage, the databases. And then uh, recently, a few months ago, we re revised our accounts page for patrons, and we wanted to kind of get some feedback from them. So we easily set up a trigger, set up the time, and with a message after, I don't remember now, actually 45 seconds something, we asked them if they needed any assistance and how do you find the new page. And so we left that up there for a while. And then once people started to actually just ask research questions from the My Accounts page, we realized we could begin to take that off. Uh, so they, they, the students love it, I have to say. Uh, and actually the faculty, just this morning when I was on chat, it was, it's great to hear that, you know, a faculty member saying, I just want to tell you again how much I love this service. It's so with the explosion in the number of patrons we're dealing with, uh, statistics have been very, very important. 
even more so than <laughs> like when I was doing them before with the chat system. This is a monthly report that is sent from Zopum. It's pretty basic. Uh, as you can see, it has page views and things, but the two most important numbers there are the ones I circled, which are the total chats. Uh, this was from October of last year. That was the busiest month ever that we've had so far. Um, and then over on the right, you'll see it says chats completed, chats dropped, chats missed. So we went through all of these categories, I did, and made sure what they were. We wanted, you know, I see 200 missed chats and I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And so I dug into those a lot and what we discovered were uh, half of those were patrons saying, no thanks, I don't need any help. And the librarian doesn't respond. And so it's really not a reference transaction. So that's the largest section of that. There are also, Sometimes because of the trigger, once in a while people will type in, like they, they're thinking they're gonna search in a search box, but they start, and actually, if, if I may confess, I have chatted with myself on a couple of occasions. You get very busy and I type in climate change and economics, and then I hear the chat go off, and I'm like, oh my God, not another chat. And I look at it and it's like, oh, that's weird. It's the same topic, it's the same class. That really happened, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, once in a while, that's a low number, but sometimes it does happen. So what we found were the chats missed, uh, really only, we only missed 2% of our chats, genuinely do not respond to a patron, which I find stunning because when we were doing 2,000 a year at Stony Brook, we were trying to keep it under 10% of missed chats. And now with such an enormous volume, I was so impressed with our librarians that and it gets really busy sometimes, but we don't miss that many chats, realistically. Then I also looked at chats dropped. That sounded dire. So uh, that turns out those are really reference transactions, though. The, Zopum, it basically, I think, is when the patron says the last thing in a chat and they immediately leave, they call it a dropped chat, I guess because we didn't finish it or they didn't do something. But I've looked through those, and those are legitimate chats. So really, when we're trying to figure out how much each month we're doing, it's the total chats only minus the chats missed. And then we do have offline messages you'll see, um, which you know come in overnight. We handle those just like lib answers, questions, or email reference. Uh, we'll do those first thing in the morning. There's not too many of those, as you'll notice. Uh, chats on until 11 at night starts at nine in the morning uh, most days, but we do get some in the middle of the night. So in addition to that monthly report, uh, Zopum sends us uh, very detailed files each month that we can go through and use to create things like this. This is our spreadsheet. This was October 2015, and I was able to figure out the average number of chats per hour to see you know, when are the hot spots the red being the most. Um, you'll see Thursday from 11 to 12, we were averaging 19 questions in one hour. And then the orange is a little less, and then the yellow, and then the white. As you can see, Saturday, not a real popular day, so we only have one person on most of the day. But um, this has been incredibly helpful. But it also allowed us to expand, because in, we, I was seeing enough questions between 10 and 11 that we were like, oh, let's try nine, and sure enough, it's not as much, but you can see it's 10 questions an hour a couple of days. And now we're about to expand to midnight because we get so many questions um, between 10 and 11. You're, you see a lot of those are nine, eight, nine questions an hour from that time period. Um, and we can do other things. Zopum, you can also just look within Zopum. I've been able to verify a lot by seeing what they send us, and then you can use their search mechanism to go between very specific time periods, and I can see how many chats there are, and I can read them to see what were the missed chats, what were the dropped chats. William, you mentioned, or I think it was mentioned, you have uh, librarian staffing. Do you have librarian staffing from 9 to midnight? We do, yes. Professional librarians? Yes. All of them are professional librarians. And, three, um, what, three of them are part-time or four? We have three part-time, well, now four part-time. We just, she starts today. Uh, um, 
but they actually, the part-time librarians handle about 50% or a little more of the questions because they're doing primarily chat. The subject specialists do X number a week um, because of everything else they're, they're working on. So another great way to help uh, is to have these shortcuts. And I will say, having used Question Point and LibChat, these shortcuts in Zopem are fantastic. You're in the middle of the chat, you start typing the word and it populates, you know, and boom, you send it off like that. You don't have to think about it. Like, I don't know, I remember the canned messages, I had to go and do a drop down menu and choose it, but this is super easy. Um, when it's very busy, and even when it's not, uh, they can be very useful. You can see just, this is a sampling uh, we are doing about 125 shortcuts. And we, you know, I went through and reviewed all of them. Some are not used that much. Some are used a lot. Um, but if, and we actually eliminated some that weren't being used at all. But you can see the first one's canceling a study room. We'll get a fair number of questions. The, there's a link to information for one of the subject specialists. So we try to refer a lot. It's chat. It's hard to accomplish some of the things we've been able to do at the desk in the past and you really want to make sure that they're able to come in and talk with someone in person. So we do refer as much as we can. Um, points of view, academic search completes. So some of our popular databases will have links that we send to them. Uh, policies, I see alumni borrowing you know, things. Where are the book drops? And then things like anything else, which actually help a lot, what I, I would call conversational shortcuts. Hello, how may I help you? Um, I'll be with you in a moment. I'm helping you know, other people right now. There's different things. Uh, is, there anything else? is there anything else I can help you with? These come in very handy when you're handling multiple people at the same time. Um, and these are even easier to set up than the triggers. I mean, give it a name, type in the message, hit create shortcut. And you can create those on the fly, which we've done in some cases. Uh, weird network problem. Or the classic one, a middle school who discovered our website in our chat service, and suddenly we were flooded with middle schoolers asking all kinds of interesting questions. Um, the, the classic one, are you a robot? We get that from time to time, although less now. We used to get that a lot in the beginning. But um, so, created a little message to send to our middle schoolers and send that off. Actually, it came up again just recently, night that an assignment was due. One of the, the only database that could be used went down and we were getting flooded. So the librarian just created that instantly and was able to handle it. So when you're, again, getting multiple questions. Um, so those are really nice, very useful. And then my, f what, yeah, I think this is super exciting, m mining the chat transcripts. This, I didn't really just think about it at first, but it's, it's really fascinating because it's both qualitative information and quantitative because we have 27,000 plus chats a year. What are our patrons talking about? You know, what do they want to know about? What are they complaining about? And actually it was Jan who said the first time it really started to click with me was, uh, hey, let's look at all the noise complaints. What are people saying? Because they, they would use chat a lot, makes sense. They don't want to get up and you know, go tell on somebody or things like that. So we were able to go through and using the search mechanism and Zopum, be able to look up noise, loud, quiet, various terms for a time period and very precisely figure out what people were saying. We went through all the ones we could find. And you'll see there, uh, can someone please tell the people next to the quiet study area on the second floor <laughs> to turn down their videos or music? Uh, third floor quiet zone, sombria, yeah. How do I submit a noise complaint? Uh, how can I file a noise complaint? Study room 23 on the second floor. So what we found was, um, and actually, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I debated when to put these slides. I'll go back. We were able to very precisely figure out where the noise was happening. And it was basically two areas. Our fourth floor area, which was not enclosed and was hard to keep it quiet. And then we kind of realized that our third floor quiet zone was surrounded by study rooms, as opposed to the other side, which was surrounded by faculty offices. So switch 
We did that. We moved the quiet zone from the fourth floor down to an enclosed area on the second floor. But having a map, you know, and being able to see specifically, I mean, they were giving it, because we would ask them, you know, can you give us a call number range or whatever <laughs> would help us. Um, so that was, and after that, it was suddenly like, oh, hey, we can look up all kinds of things. Because I'm also on the, our web presence team and our discovery team, where we're investigating, you know, how are patrons using the websites? How are they finding resources? What problems? That was the big thing. We're, because the, also because of uh, live call, we had, you know, we could see that people were frustrated across all the levels with accessing online resources. Well, what does that mean? So we started going in, and you can see this is the search thing uh, mechanism. And it's very easy, keyword, it worked really well too. Uh, date range, time range, which can be very helpful at times. Um, and that's usually what we're doing to, to find ebooks. So we've been analyzing what are all the issues that people are running into with our ebooks? Which platforms? Uh, what are they trying to do when they have a problem? What titles are they trying to access? Uh, streaming video, we did <coughs> the same thing. So now we're keeping track of these. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then also, this is how we find, you can see we can look for the different kinds of chats, triggered and things like that. So that's one way we're able to determine uh, percentages, like how complex something is. Or chats by a person, when, uh, you know, it's, I can go through and uh, look for people. And the, also, the chat transcripts are just fantastic for training purposes. Um, you know, it's just wonderful to have these reference transactions that people can study to see you know, what's a good job at doing this. And I review our chats on a regular basis to um, pick up on things, uh, trends, and we use the search feature. If I notice a couple of things and I'm like, uh-oh, this book title is having issues. Let me go in and sure enough, oh my God, there was, you know, what, because they happen just infrequently enough sometimes, it's an assignment usually. And then all of a sudden you see there's 14 chats about the same ebook. Well, boom, we can go in and make sure it gets straightened out. We had that recently, um, database issues. Um, what are courses? We've also, uh, we see weird assignments. The one, you have, you have to do a search on men and the culture, but it has to be from a print journal, you know, all 37 we have left, and uh, the poor <laughs> kids. You know, these kids, they had no idea how to search for something within a print journal. So when we started to see that, we're like, we better talk to this professor. Is this really, you know, do they, you know, and we contacted them. And, um, and we can also see what kinds of questions are coming in based on a course or a program. We, for the psychology librarian, we did, we did research on psychology, just that term. We looked up psych info and other databases and resources. How many times were they coming up? What were people saying? So it's been a fantastic um, source for us. And then this is just us tracking ebook problems. Um, we have the date and time. You can copy and paste that pretty easily. The visitor number and the date and time allow us to go and look at the actual transcript. And we found a way to put the transcript in the spreadsheet, but it was really clunky. So, but um, yeah, the question, the title, the provider, and what we did. And so that's this is uh, from September 22nd through November 9th. These were some ebook questions using different terms to try to find um, what people are looking for. So on that note, data mining, we're, that's all I have. And so we would love to get questions from you all. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks so much for all your questions. Thank and for you. coming to the